Hi, I'm Mr. Schwenk, and this is Cleo's Corner. In our last episode, we investigated what could have possibly motivated Europeans to risk death at sea to explore the world around them. As you might expect, it mostly had to do with money. Asia had luxury items that a growing number of wealthy Europeans wanted. However, the Italians and the Arabs were standing in the way. So nations like Spain and Portugal and England, France and the Netherlands decided to try to find their own ways of reaching the East Indies, as East Asia was referred to back then. Along the way, however, these Europeans innovated new methods in shipping and mathematics and science to allow them to sail the open ocean without getting lost all the time, although this was still a very frequent occurrence. In fact, the greatest result in what we call the age of exploration was due to a gross miscalculation on the part of one such explorer. Today on Clio's Corner, we're going to ask the question of where did the European explorers sail to, what attracted them to that area, and what did they find when they got there? There was not an absolute beginning to the age of exploration, nor did every nation start exploring at the same time. Securing a route to the East Indies and the money that could be generated from having one was an absolute state secret. Sharing that information with other nations would be like uh, Apple or Samsung publishing the blueprints to their next generation device before it launches or the U.S. government publishing a map with all of its nuclear launch sites on it. This was a very hush-hush game, but every nation spied on each other and slowly the information spread. Although typically we point to Portugal as being the first European nation to make exploration a prime priority. This was due to the efforts of Prince Henry, son of the King of Portugal. Henry understood the importance of trade routes from his dealings with Arabs on in nearby Africa. He used his wealth to create a navigation school and to commission ship captains to sail farther and farther along the coast of Africa. It took many voyages to keep pushing the boundaries of how far they could sail, but they mapped their progress along the way, improved their technology, and gained more experience at sea. Eventually, in 1488, the Portuguese explorer Bartolomeu Dias became the first European to sail around the southern tip of Africa, which he named the Cape of Storms, or what we call today the Cape of Good Hope. It did not take long for more Portuguese to explorers to repeat this task, and eventually Vasco da Gama succeeded in reaching India by sea. Considering how valuable this accomplishment was, the Portuguese fortified the Cape of Good Hope, which is already dangerous to sail around, and they claimed the route as their own. They're not letting anybody else uh, use their trade route. The Portuguese success only spurred their nearest neighbor to their own exploration. Uh, With this sea route shut down around Africa by the Portuguese, Spain put their trust in a bold Italian explorer who believed that the shortest path to Asia was to sail west and go entirely around the world. When Christopher Columbus set sail with his three ships, no one knew if he would be successful or not. It took Columbus five weeks to cross the Atlantic before spotting land in what is today known as the Caribbean Islands. There's wide disagreement on exactly which of these islands Columbus landed on, Nonetheless, rather than landing in Asia, Columbus had unwittingly discovered a new continent unbeknownst to Europeans. For Columbus's part, however, he maintained to the end of his days that he had actually sailed to Asia. Since Columbus was trying to get to the Spice Islands of East Indies, the Caribbean Islands were incorrectly named the West Indies. This name is stuck to this day, and you'll hear people refer to it as the West Indies periodically. Word of Columbus's discovery spread around Europe quickly, but Spain already had the route and was bringing back never-before-seen products, thus starting the exchange of plants and animals and people and diseases that we talked about last week, known as the Columbian Exchange. Spain continued to explore the Caribbean, hearing rumors from natives of spectacularly wealthy cities of gold further west. Several more explorers searched out these native empires. 
The most famous of these were Hernando Cortez and Francisco Pizarro, who were the first Europeans to meet the Aztec Empire in modern-day Mexico and the Incan Empire in South America. In each of these cases, these conquistadores, or conquerors, were greeted by the natives and welcomed uh, into their cities. Cortez and Pizarro then attacked and slaughtered the natives, stealing all of their gold. Disease did the rest. There are many descriptions of the event, but all that survive come from Spanish sources, so they are extremely questionable in their biases. The main goal of the Spanish in the New World was to mine or grow all the resources it possibly could from the land. Since the land they stumbled upon was so fantastically rich, the Spanish largely abandoned their plans to reach the East and instead focused on exploring the Americas. Spanish settlements took the form of three types, missions, presidios, and encomiendas. Encomiendas were villages and towns for economic purposes. It's where the majority of people lived. They would mine or grow resources there. Presidios were the forts and strongholds where the Spanish army and fleets were based, and missions were church, village churches, uh, or village, church villages rather, for the purpose of converting natives to Christianity. Natives, for their part, were used for slave labor, but when they would convert to Christianity, it then became illegal to hold them as slaves. Either way, they tended to die in overwhelming numbers from disease. Without the natives to work, the Spanish turned to African slaves, repopulating entire islands with Africans and beginning the Atlantic slave trade. For nearly 200 years, Spain used the wealth of Central America to build its navy into the single strongest fleet the world had ever seen to that point. Spain was the undisputed heavyweight nation in Europe. Other explorers continued to push boundaries as well. Vasco de Balboa discovered the Isthmus of Panama and became the first European to see the eastern shore of the Pacific Ocean. Ferdinand Magellan's voyage became the first to circle or circumnavigate the world. Magellan was able to chart a passage around the south was also able to ch chart a passage around the southern tip of South America. He himself was killed while in the Philippine Islands, but the rest of his crew completed the trip without him. Other European nations were not just sitting by watching Spain and Portugal get stupid rich. The Dutch, who relied on commerce and business to survive, commissioned the English explorer Henry Hudson to search for a northwest passage to Asia, similar to the one Magellan found in the south. Although he was unsuccessful, Hudson still mapped much of the east coast of North America, including the river that bears his name to this day in the city of New York. The Dutch settled small towns in several different parts of the world and pretty much tried not to compete with their bigger neighbors. Instead, they were more interested in economics and making money. They came up with the idea of giving only one group a monopoly on trade in the area. This maximized the amount of money the group could make. These groups were known as trading companies and marks the beginning of a new way of doing business that we now know as a corporation. By the time that the British and French got into the exploration game, the Spanish and Portuguese had already claimed quite a bit of land in the Americas. This limited both of these nations to exploration in North America, which was seen as not having much to offer. The British sent out John Cabot and Henry Hudson, now working for his fellow English, to explore the coast of North America and to continue looking for the fabled Northwest Passage. This would not work out so well for Hudson, who, in the bay that is named after him and running out of supplies, uh, his sailors mutinied and put Hudson and his son adrift in a rowboat and sailed away. No one saw them ever again. The British ultimately saw North America as a land of rich resources. To make use of those resources, they would need people to live there permanently. Natives were sometimes cooperated with, but mostly ignored or forced from their land. 
since our nation was founded as the descendants of these colonies, we will go into much greater detail about them on, in our next episode. As other nations settled into their claimed areas, the British kept expanding their horizons. Sir Francis Drake became the first Englishman to circumnavigate the world and to open the door to numerous later captains to explore, claim land in the Pacific, including Australia, and make Britain the hands down most prolific colonizers of this period. The French, on the other hand, had little to no interest in leaving their beloved France for a new and undeveloped land. They did send explorers and claimed land, but only made a couple large permanent settlements like the cities of New Orleans, Montreal, and Quebec. The majority of Frenchmen explorers uh, explored in the Great Lakes and the Mississippi River Valley. Jacques Cartier, Marquette and Joliet, Robert LaSalle, Samuel de Champlain explored what is today Upper Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys. They claimed a vast area that they called Louisiana, although it was never fully colonized. Rather, they really focused on trading furs with the natives and then just moving on. The French had the best relations with these native people because they had no interest in moving in or pushing the locals off the land. These trappers and traders, known as coureurs de bois, would sometimes become so invested in America and the relationship with the natives was so good that it was not uncommon for them to wind up marrying into native tribes and become becoming native in their own right. Either way, while relations between the French and the natives were maybe not always perfect, the two groups generally got along really well. In conclusion, what we've learned in this episode is that European nations were all after the resources of the East, but what they found was an entirely new land with lots of resources of its own. Each nation tried to find their own way to make use of these resources. The Portuguese got the ball rolling in Europe and were the only ones to actually reach India in the East. They did get in on New World colonization in South America. New World colonization in the Caribbean and Central America made Spain the, the power player in Europe for a long time. But once the gold and silver started to dry up, their power did too. It was Northern European nations like Britain and the Netherlands who came out the best because of new ways of doing business like corporations, which we'll talk about next time. The Dutch pretty much kept under the radar and got rich while the British were left in North America which they turned into a powerhouse of colonies. The French were, well, French, and were mostly focused on finding resources and hightailing it back to their baguettes and cheese back home, although they were the only ones who treated the natives decently. The real losers in all of this were the natives, whose empires were destroyed, land stolen, and population devastated by European disease. Next week, we're going to look deeper at the English colonies that will eventually become America. Thanks for listening. See you next week on the next episode of Cleo's Corner.